by Fletcher to Adrian. <laughs> It's really it's such an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. And I actually prepared a PowerPoint. You all have copies of um, my article. It's available in English and in Spanish. And I really wanted to publish it in Spanish because it's about um, the right to vote in Spanish for Puerto Ricans. So I hope that it reaches people who prefer Spanish <laughs> as well. Um, so my idea when I did the PowerPoint is just a very quick outline of the article. And I've got about 28 slides. So I'm going to do one slide per minute. and. This first one is just telling you the title of the article and publish it with Berkeley La Raza Law Journal and we're distributing it through the Center for Puerto Rican Studies. Um, I want to emphasize that I wrote this article entirely in my personal capacity and what that means is that it doesn't necessarily reflect the opinions of the Department of Justice. So I'm here as myself and not necessarily representing the Department of Justice. Um, and I wrote this article because um, I met a lot of people who needed their voting rights protected and started asking around in the field um, you know, to find out what could be done. And I wanted to say thank you to uh, the folks who helped me with this article, including Juan Cartagena and everyone from Pearl and Hernan Bahio and Jose Perez from the uh, Latino uh, Alliance of New Jersey, and also to Ida Rivera and Susana Lorenzo Guiller and Alberto Ruiz Sanchez and Peyton McCrary, who are all colleagues of the Department of Justice who helped me with this article. And again, it's mine, so the mistakes are mine and the opinions are mine, but I want to thank my colleagues in this field who established this area of law. So the next slide is just an introduction. Um, the article follows the, chronolo the chronological order of the establishment of Puerto Rican citizenship and voting rights on the island and then stateside. And I did this as a law review article, but it also tells stories and recounts past victories, so we can build on the past victories. It will show how rights established through the 1965 Voting Rights Act should be revitalized as currently over one million stateside Puerto Ricans may be experiencing violations of their rights to vote with equal access and in their primary language. The main thesis is right here. Over one million stateside Puerto Ricans may be living without the protections of the rights guaranteed to them by the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Section 4E of the 1965 Voting Rights Act um, was enacted specifically to prohibit the denial of voting rights to persons born in Puerto Rico and educated in Puerto Rico based on any inability to read or write or understand any matter in English. The Supreme Court has emphasized the practical effect of Section 4E was to prohibit denying the right to vote to large segments of the Puerto Rican community and thereby furthering the aims of the Equal Protection Clause with regard to the right that is preservative of all rights. And this is how the US legal system has always considered voting rights. This is actually from a case called Dick Wool v. Hopkins that established rights to citizenship to anyone born in the United States. Um, the first right that goes with citizenship is voting because that's uh, considered the top in, in, in the priority of rights in the United States legal system. For Puerto Ricans, this is the obvious, there is no requirement to speak English in order to be US citizens. So if Puerto Ricans prefer Spanish or they don't understand the ballot in English, or if they have limited English proficiency to use the statutory term of art, their voting rights are compromised if elections are held only in English. Doesn't mean everyone, obviously a lot of people are bilingual, but for those who aren't, their voting rights may not be denied or compromised by the elections being held in English under Section 4E. Um, the article has four sections and it goes from the past to the present. Um, the first section covers 1945 to 1975. Uh, it talks about the Great Migration around World War II and after World War II, and then the first generation Puerto Rican voting rights cases here in the U.S. starting with the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Uh, the second section talks about the 1975 Voting Rights Act amendments, which kind of changed the playing field and may or may not have affected Section 4E. Then the third section talks about this current generation of new migration um, and where it is that the Puerto Rican community is migrating to today and what are some of the new stateside Puerto Rican voting rights issues that are arising currently. And the fourth is the conclusion that it's time to revive Puerto Rican voting rights. Um, so to start with uh, number one, the brief history of Puerto Rican mi migration and the 1965 to 75 voting rights cases. Um, um, the Great Migration occurred around 1945, and uh, Puerto Rican migration to the United States actually uh, became uh, possible and started with uh, the passage of the Jones Act in 1917. Um, that's the year that it became clear that Puerto Ricans were U.S. citizens and that this was retroactive. 
Um, this was also around the time of the First World War, and some of the reasons for granting citizenship were to make sure that Puerto Ricans could serve in the armed forces, and also to come and, and work uh, in factories and to provide very cheap labor, to put it bluntly. Um, there was never, uh, the goals included migration. Um, the other uh, point I wanted, to rec I wanted to emphasize is that from the very beginning, there was never any requirement to speak English to be a U.S. citizen if you're Puerto Rican. Um, the other characteristic I wanted to emphasize about this era is that Spanish was the primary language in Puerto Rico in its school system. And I have you know, details about that history in the article, um, but suffice it to say that uh, the U.S. colonial government tried to implement English in the public school system in Puerto Rico. It didn't work. It was a big disaster. And so Spanish remains, the, and Spanish uh, um, became the, the primary language uh, classroom language of education in Puerto Rico. English is a language class. Um, it's like you take Spanish here. English is just a second language that you learn in Puerto Rico. The public school system in Puerto Rico is taught in Spanish. Um, that was particularly true since 1947 because once the Commonwealth government came into power, they clarified that even more. Um, so the Great Migration, uh, Puerto Rican Migration, started with the Jones Act, and at that point, thousands of Puerto Ricans came to New York City to work in the factories. A lot of intellectuals and artists and other people came, but most people who came here came here to work in the factories. Um, and then in 1952, the new Commonwealth policy started encouraging uh, migration for population control and for purposes of economic development. Still today in Latin America, um, migration is considered a tool for, for development. So a lot of the um, immigrants here will be sending back remittances to their countries in Latin America. And governments here and there consider this a tool for development. They're not very open about it sometimes, but um, the people who uh, do the macroeconomic policies of the United States you know, know that the remittances are a very important tool for development in Latin America. Um, so um, considering all these circumstances with the Commonwealth encouraging migration and the United States uh, stateside government encouraging migration, in 1940 to 1950, 151,000 men and women arrived. Then from 1950 to 1960, nearly half a million uh, men and women came from the island to live stateside. Um, this was 470,000 out of 2 million. 2 million is the population of the island. That means that during these years, 21% of the population of the island migrated. This is just unprecedented. It's a very dramatic level of migration. Um, the only other uh, um, uh, national origin that comes close to it is the Irish. Um, and uh, um, uh, it's the only other comparable group of migrants to the United States, that one fifth of the population would come here. Not even Mexico has reached that level. Um, like the Irish, Puerto Ricans came to work and live in pretty exploitative conditions. Um, and unfortunately, not like the Irish, um, haven't always been able to advance in the same way um, due to some of the structural discrimination in our system in the United States. Um, the other characteristic of Puerto Rican migration, the Great Migration, and still today, is that migration is circular. So people go back and forth to the island and have uh, a lot of ties with the island, whereas the Irish, I mean, I'm Irish-American, my great-grandparents and grandparents came, and I've never seen it. Um, there's, there's a big ocean in between, and we just have different characteristics. But for Puerto Ricans, people go back and forth to the island, um, may go to school some there, may go to school some here, um, and keep a Puerto Rican identity here in, in, on the stateside. Um, part of that identity is speaking Spanish. Um, still today, 81.5% of stateside, stateside Puerto Ricans speak Spanish at home. It's a really high level of identity. Um, and um, so what happened? Folks came here. Uh, they were U.S. citizens. They were encouraged to come here. They go to vote. And uh, um, the state of New York, which is the uh, number one destination, decided to enact English literacy requirements, that you can't vote here in New York um, unless you can pass an English literacy test. Um, Section 4E of the Voting Rights Act was enacted in 1965 in order to stop this practice that was part of the legislative history of the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Hernan Bayou included in his testimony that the New York uh, English literacy requirement was discriminatory on its face. And, and in the lawyer's world, that's like the worst kind of discrimination. It's the hardest kind that you can prove. It means flat out, they said, we don't want Puerto Ricans voting. We want to maintain a citizenship that's Anglo-oriented, and we don't want them voting. And so this is what it is we're going to do. Um, so uh, Section 40 of the Voting Rights Act, again, it says, I don't know if you remember, but 
that uh, voting rights for someone educated in Puerto Rico and Spanish may not be conditioned on any inability to read or write or understand or interpret any matter in the English language. Uh, so this was a conflict between federal law and state law. Then 21-year-old Maria Lopez attempted to register to vote in Rochester. The Election Commission of Monroe County said it was their policy to deny her. She couldn't pass the English language literacy test because she just got here from the island and she was educated in Spanish and so she didn't really understand that much English yet. On top of it, how could she read a ballot with all of the complexities if her whole education was in Spanish? So the, unfortunately, the Monroe County Election Commission said, sorry, it's our policy to deny her. Despite Section 40, we've read the Federal Voting Rights Act, New York State says that you have to speak English to vote, and that's that. Um, Attorney General John Dower in 1965 brought her case to the federal court in the Western District of New York. And the Western District of New York ruled that, first of all, the Voting Rights Act wasn't just to solve problems in the Deep South. That's, that was a misconception about the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act was born out of problems in the South, but it was devised to eliminate second-class citizenship wherever it was present. Second of all, the constitutionality of Section 40 was challenged. Um, hey, Diana, the, and um, the, you, the federal court held that um, 40 was a valid exercise of congressional power under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. It reviewed the purposes of Section 40, and the purposes included fighting discrimination. The 14th Amendment is the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution. So they said that Congress was well within its powers. If they wanted to fight discrimination, this was a good way to do it. Then the, the, um, the federal court reviewed the Puerto Rican school system and came to the same conclusion we just did, that public education is in Spanish, and then issued a permanent injunction against the New York State literacy, English literacy requirement that would permit Maria Lopez and tens of thousands of other Puerto Rican um, migrants here in New York to vote without having to pass it. New York State had raised a defense, which is a very common defense still today, under the 10th Amendment. The 10th Amendment says voting rights are up to the states. Anything the states want to do to run their elections, they can do it, as long as it's not in conflict with federal law. Um, but the court held that, even though other federal courts were ruling differently, um, federal law trumped state law, and um, Section 4A was completely constitutional, and the, uh, the Congress was, uh, well within its powers, and upgrading the people of the island of Puerto Rico to full and complete citizenship through the enactment of FORI was a judgment that Congress was superbly suited to make, so Congress could go ahead and trump state law in this important area of anti-discrimination law. Um, and what happened? Uh, that case went all the way to the 1966 Supreme Court, because the Monroe County Election Commission and here in New York City, the Election Commission uh, didn't want to have to stop the English language literacy requirements. Um, Cardona v. Power went up to the Supreme Court, and that case, unfortunately, which was also from New York, was lost. Um, it, said, it was on behalf of a gentleman who hadn't had a sixth grade education, and at that time, literacy requirements were still in place in the United States legal system, so they couldn't enforce Section 40 on behalf of him. Um, the other case that went all the way up um, that stemmed from the case of Maria Lopez was Katzenbach v. Morgan, and that was an appeal from her case against the New York Constitution, the New York election laws, and a group of concerned citizens who thought that you should speak English before you became a US citizen, which is something that resonates quite often today still. Justice Brennan held in 1966 that despite the 10th Amendment that gives states power in elections, states may not legislate in contravention of the 14th and 15th Amendment. The 14th Amendment provides for equal protection, the 15th Amendment provides for the right to vote for everybody. He, uh, the Supreme Court opinion held that 40 was constitutional, and the result was, once again, half a million Puerto Ricans in New York were no longer subject to the English language literacy test. Um, the case was groundbreaking, um, and it still has an impact today. Um, this case of Maria Lopez and half a million Puerto Ricans here in New York. It laid the legal foundation for banning literacy tests. At that time in the United States, everybody had to pass a literacy test. Another practice that had come about um, since desegregation and since the, I'm sorry, since the Civil War amendments uh, during the Jim Crow era was to make uh, uh, the, the newly freed slaves or people who are citizens of the United States who are people of color uh, subject to literacy requirements which made it very difficult for them to register to vote. 
Um, this case, which was about Puerto Ricans here in the north, actually turned out to be really helpful in the Deep South as well, because it was a way of showing that Congress could legislate to ban literacy tests if they had a discriminatory impact. You no longer had to prove that it was discriminatory on its face. It's very, very hard to prove that. But if these tests had a discriminatory impact, Congress could legislate to ban them. So in 1970, they did. This was based on uh, Maria Lopez's case. Uh, the case was also used in 1980 and 1997 Supreme Court opinions on Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Section 5 is another section of the Voting Rights Act that has protected millions of voters. And uh, they said that, congressional, that Congress had the authority to enact appropriate legislation to enforce the 14th and 15th Amendment. This came from the case of Cotton Godfrey Morgan. Uh, third, it was the first case of holding language uh, access for any limited English proficient voters, uh, uh, the um, abbreviation for that statutory term of art. So it's a very groundbreaking case. Um, that case was brought on behalf of one voter. It had an impact on half a million voters, but it was behalf on, um, brought on behalf of one voter in her name. Um, soon thereafter, um, uh, the community got even more active and even more empowered and decided to bring class action lawsuits under Section 40 of the Voting Rights Act. And the article then goes on to talk about uh, the 1970s urban population decisions. And these are the ones that have really founded the basis for class action voting rights. Um, okay. Hey, so good to have Hi. you here. How are you? I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Okay. <laughs> So the first of the urban population decisions is Propo v. Cusper, and it was in the Seventh Circuit, decided in 1972. And this case actually was not only uh, uh, groundbreaking on behalf of Puerto Rican voters in Chicago and in other cities, but it established the American legal rule that the right to vote includes not just the right to pull the lever, but the right to vote an informed and effective vote. So what does that mean? If you don't understand what the ballot says, and you're just pulling a lever, and you're not exercising your right to vote. And if there's a system that makes it so that you don't understand because of your background or your language or your literacy, um, then that system may be discriminatory when other people can just go ahead and vote a fully informed and effective ballot. So you know, that's something that came from the PROPA case that's been quoted right and left in so many other voting rights cases. Um, what happened is that uh, Forty became applied to thousands of Puerto Rican voters um, who were educated in Spanish, and the court held that they had the right to bilingual poll workers, and they had the right to election materials and information in Spanish wherever this was needed. So thousands of Puerto Rican voters in Chicago now have bilingual ballots and bilingual poll workers, and they can vote in the language that they understand. Um, it also, this case also included a long analysis of Spanish le uh, language education in Puerto Rico. Um, then we have the Pearl Death urban population cases. One is in Philadelphia and one is in New York. The first is Arroyo v. Tucker. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Um, in Philadelphia, voters born in Puerto Rico uh, were found, uh, the court found they couldn't cast informed or effective ballots if the elections were held in English only. Lots of people came straight from the island to work in the factories in Philadelphia during this time of the Great Migration. And in the 70s, they lived in some pretty bad conditions. It was very hard to learn English. And on top of it, they'd gone to school in Spanish, so they didn't understand the ballot, but very much wanted to vote. So the Arroyo case held that Philadelphia had to provide um, the same uh, three remedies that the PROPA court ordered. Um, it's a three-pronged remedy. The first is bilingual election materials, including especially the ballot. The second is bilingual poll workers. And the third is Spanish language election information. And it had to be publicized uh, information about the election, where you should vote, where's your polling place, how should you register, can you vote by absentee voting, all the things that you hear about elections. Not only had to be in Spanish, but they had to be publicized in an effective way in the type of media that reaches the community. Um, so that's usually radio, actually. Um, and this was ordered in every census tract that had a 5% Puerto Rican population. Here in New York, millions, I'm sorry, near, nearly a million Puerto Ricans were living here, no, over a million by, by the time of the Torres v. Sachs case. And the court found the same thing, that these people, could, uh, that people um, who were educated in Puerto Rico were having their voting rights compromised by uh, uh, um, uh, their, an inability in reading and writing and understanding English. And so therefore, um, from now on, New York had to provide these three things, bilingual election materials, bilingual poll workers, and Spanish language election information. 
Um, this decision went beyond the bilingual ballot. Um, the decision was used to show also that uh, New York and Bronx and King counties could not escape Section 5 scrutiny under the Voting Rights Act. And the details of that are in the article, but let me just tell you really quickly is that uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act applies only when there's been a history of discrimination. And it has a very high level of scrutiny. Places like uh, these counties in New York, um, whenever they want to change the redistricting system or whenever they want to cha make any change in voting systems, have to submit that change first to the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice has to determine if it would have a discriminatory impact or not. Um, just after the Torres case, these counties tried to escape from that scrutiny. And a later lawsuit was, uh, a, a lawsuit was brought soon thereafter saying that uh, uh, it's not true that there's no more discrimination in Bronx and in the Bronx and New York and Kings County. Look, there is discrimination against Puerto Rican voters and some of the discrimination that you say has uh, disappeared against African American voters certainly hasn't disappeared. So those counties must still be section <coughs> by scrutiny. Um, let's see. Um, these cases that I just talked about are classic forms of impact <coughs> litigation. And what does that mean? If you're going to do some litigation, you know, don't just do it to win one case, but to make an impact that's beyond uh, just the one case. So I actually, in writing this article, did a lot of census research and a lot of math, and I found out I mean, I, I, the that over one million Puerto Rican citizens were helped just by these three cases in the 70s. The Torres case helped uh, that many voters. The Propa case ha um, helped 112,000 voters. And in Philadelphia, 46,587. Puerto Ricans were helped. So over a million Puerto Rican citizens were provided with bilingual access just by these three cases. And these cases um, um, were also important because they hit the three largest cities in terms of where Puerto Ricans were migrating during this time. And so it helped a great number of people here stateside who had arrived from the island. Um, there are some other cases too. And if you talk to Juan Cartagena, who's right before us now, you will see in his two law review articles on this subject that uh, there are some other early Section 40 cases, and um, one of them was in Bridgeport, Connecticut, um, and this was a case that had, uh, it was like, there was an, um, another large Puerto Rican community. Uh, the jurisdiction didn't want to put the ballot in Spanish, but the community brought a case, and they were able to get a consent decree, um, and so uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut needed to have uh, bilingual ballots and bilingual election materials and uh, bilingual poll workers. And this case was also interesting too because later it was picked up by a court saying this shows there's a history of discrimination in voting here in Bridgeport. So it went beyond you know, just the language issue or talked about discrimination in voting. Um, and there's other cases that are in one's law review articles which uh, you know, are really um, groundbreaking and, and I recommend them to everybody. Um, Another case that was brought during this time period was Ortiz versus the New York State Board of Elections. And this was brought in the Western District of New York in 1974. And this was a stateside class action on behalf of limited English proficient Puerto Ricans in New York, with the exception of New York City, because the Torres case had already been won. And if you remember, Maria Lopez was in Rochester in Monroe County. There are a lot of Puerto Ricans living outside of uh, New York City um, um, uh, here in New York. Um, and so this uh, was a class action on their behalf, and uh, there was a consent decree that the federal court uh, signed on to, an order, saying that any county, city, town, or village with 10% or more Puerto Rican population uh, was required to provide the three prongs of bilingual access, bilingual materials and information, and uh, bilingual poll workers. And at the time, in, in 1974, it impacted about 30,000 Puerto Ricans um, in New York State. Um, in Rochester, Albany, Haverstraw, and other places. I really would like to emphasize that this consent decree is still alive. It has no expiration date. But if you go around New York, you'll notice they're not providing the ballot in Spanish. They're not in compliance with this consent decree. Okay. Um, so moving away from section one, we covered the whole Great Migration and the whole 1965 to 1975 uh, voting rights cases. Um, coming up to 1975. In 1975, the Voting Rights um, Act was amended, um, and uh, several things happened based in large part on these 4E cases that expanded the Voting Rights Act. Um, one of the um, expansions was that the uh, amend, uh, that Section 5 scrutiny was opened for Latinos. If you remember, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act is the strictest scrutiny, and it's for places that have a history of discrimination 
And if you're uh, a jurisdiction that has a history of discrimination, you need to submit every voting change to the Department of Justice for preclearance. So redistricting schemes that try to dilute uh, the Latino vote, the African American vote, the Asian American vote, um, you know, need to be subjected to Section 5 scrutiny. Changes in polling places, not telling the people where the polling places are. Any kind of voting change under Section 5 has to be submitted, and the Department of Justice looks at it, and also private groups can look at, um, can, can use this section to see whether or not there will be a discriminatory impact. Not a discriminatory intent, not discriminatory in its base, but a discriminatory impact. And if there would be, they're not allowed to do it. Um, so this expanded Section 5 scrutiny was based on the 40 cases and then Maldef testimony that was uh, uh, discussed the history of discrimination against Latino voters in the Southwest. The result was that the states of Texas and New Mexico and Arizona and California were brought under the Section 5 preclearance procedures. Any voting change that had a discriminatory impact could not be enacted. Um, the statute was expanded or Section 5, I'm sorry, was expanded on behalf of language minority citizens. Um, and actually, that's a very, very awkward term. It means all Latino voters. But if I want people to know, if you take a look at the statute, the term of art is language minority citizens or language minority group. So that means uh, Latinos who also speak English, don't speak any Spanish at all, whose voting rights may be violated. And I think part of the reason that this term came out uh, the way that it did is because it was based on these language cases. Section 40 language cases, uh, although it's a very awkward term. Um, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act was also amended, and it clarified that discriminatory intent wasn't required under that section of the Voting Rights Act, and that that section of the Voting Rights Act um, um, also applied to language minority groups. By the way, the language minority groups are defined groups. They're, La they're Latinos, Asians, Native Americans, and Alaskan um, uh, natives, and so uh, there's no such thing as another language minority group until the Voting Rights Act actually establishes it. So uh, speaking English is not a language minority group, although some people think that it is, and we'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> Section 2 protects versus uh, against, the right, against vote dilution as well as against discriminatory treatment in the polls. So this expansion has been really helpful. Um, today we find a lot of incidents of discriminatory treatment of Latinos in the polls. Um, Latinos being asked for ID uh, when no one else is, um, um, sometimes accompanied by extremely hostile remarks, uh, poll workers talking as if they were, you know, repeating whatever Lou Dobbs says every night when people come to vote. So uh, um, actually the Voting Rights Act protects against that type of discrimination uh, and that comes under Section 2 and uh, I think it's a really important section. I'm glad that it was expanded to include all of these groups and um, hope that we can do some more litigation. Um, to protect those rights. Um, also in 1975, based on the great victories of Section 4E, there were new language minority provisions put into the Voting Rights Act, Section 2F203 and Section 4F4. Um, Section 4F4 um, goes by a threshold, as does Section 203. Um, let me just uh, focus on Section 203. It's a powerful, automatic, threshold-based remedy and what Section 203 says is if, there, if the number of limited English proficient citizens of a language minority group, it's a mouthful already, but a, number, a certain number of, if the number of limited English pro, uh, uh, proficient citizens of a certain language minority group, let's say Latinos, Spanish speakers, exceeds 10,000 or 5% of all voting age citizens, if a jurisdiction passes that threshold, they get a letter from the federal government saying from now on you have to provide bilingual access. And the bilingual access is the same three prongs that we've been talking about, bilingual ballots and election materials, bilingual election information, and bilingual poll workers. And it's very clear, you get a letter from the federal government that you have to do it. And uh, it still needs to be enforced, people don't always like to do it, but if once the jurisdiction falls under that threshold, that's it. Um, um, I wanted to also add that if there are oral-based languages, then like certain Native American languages, then uh, the, the, um, there, needs to be, there needs to be constant oral translation. And sometimes with Native American languages, um, a bilingual ballot isn't the answer, but having bilingual access through, um, through, um, through folks who speak the native language becomes even more important. So section 203 um, has this new threshold. And um, 
the impact of Section 203 for Spanish speakers, including, of course, Puerto Ricans, um, covered a whole lot of people. And up into the 2000 census, so looking at the 2000 census data, it covered over 2 million stateside Puerto Ricans who live in these jurisdictions. There are Calif all of California, all of New Mexico, all of Texas, and six counties in Arizona are covered automatically. They get a letter, you pass the threshold, you have to do everything in Spanish. Eight counties in Colorado, seven in Connecticut, um, let's see, uh, New York City, um, eight Florida counties, two in Illinois, six in Kansas, only one in Maryland, six Massachusetts City. All of these places in the United States are covered under Section 203 and now are required to provide bilingual access to elections. And um, again, I did some census research and found out that 2,136 and 60 stateside Puerto Ricans live in these jurisdictions. So that's pretty good. It took care of a lot of people. It was a great accomplishment. Um, some of the questions that came up after Section 203 passed, I don't know if you guys have this question, but what about everybody who doesn't live in those jurisdictions? That's one of the questions that I had. Um, another question that came up was, was Section 4E still applicable? There was this very powerful new remedy in Section 203. So were these 4E cases, was Section 4E still part of the law? Section 4E is actually written even in the individual tense. It says that the individual Puerto Rican voter is protected against this type of discrimination. Their voting rights may not be conditioned on any inability to read or write or understand any matter at all in English. Uh, and this came up in New Jersey in 1976. Um, in 1976, um, there was litigation, Marcus versus Falsi, and they entered into a consent decree. The lead plaintiff was a woman who lived in Trenton, New Jersey, in Mercer County. And Mercer County did not fall under Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act, so it wasn't automatically covered. And the state of New Jersey said, why should we have to do this in all of New Jersey? Um, we're not, we don't fall under this threshold formula. We don't meet the 203 requirements. Um, the, uh, the consent decree that was signed off on by the federal court pretty much said, that doesn't matter, 4A is still good law. Um, bi bilingual access is required in the entire state of New Jersey, no matter where you live, you can live inside or outside of these 203 covered counties if they're more than 10% Spanish surname voters. Um, furthermore, it was required that the state of New Jersey mail voter, mail voter registration forms that said, check here if you're Puerto Rican and require Spanish language election materials. Let me just emphasize that this was despite the state's arguments that 203 had replaced 4E. Um, the impact was that um, 121,397 Puerto Ricans lived outside of the 203 counties in New Jersey. And even though it was only a consent decree, it was pretty obvious that the federal court agreed that Section 40 was still applicable. Unfortunately, this is only a one-time order, so there are a lot of places in New Jersey with significant Puerto Rican populations that haven't provided the ballot in Spanish. One of them was Pennsville, New Jersey, but that was changed recently. Um, the other impact of Section 203, um, just to look at it from a very numerical perspective, is that over 2 million Puerto Ricans were protected, but over 1 million, according to the 2000 census, have been left out. Um, so here's the 2 million number again, 2 million 136 and 60 Puerto Ricans live in jurisdiction, jurisdictions that are covered under Section 203. They get a letter about the Census Bureau determinations, and they're clearly required to provide <coughs> Spanish language access. But then I looked around the country, and looked, on, uh, looked at the census data, and added it all up, and I found that 1,270,118 Puerto Ricans live in jurisdictions outside the 203 coverage. Also, 40% of stateside Puerto Ricans have limited English proficiency, and they're using the term of art from the census. That means that when the census came around, they admitted they don't speak English very well. A lot of people don't like to admit that there's other people who probably could use the protections of Section 403 who didn't admit it on the census. Um, but, um, just to err on the safe side, 40% would be covered under Section 4E. 38% um, of stateside Puerto Ricans today were born on the island. That also means it's likely they were educated in Spanish in Puerto Rico. There's no census data about where you went to school, but there is census data about where you were born. So, 38% of stateside Puerto Ricans today are li um, were born in Puerto Rico. They probably went to school in Puerto Rico, and their voting rights may be uh, conditioned unfairly and unlawfully if the ballot's in English only because they may not understand it as well as if they could have access to that ballot in their primary language. Um, 
Therefore, about 40% of 1 million stateside Puerto Ricans are likely to be experiencing 4E violations. And uh, when you see these kind of eight violations, um, uh, it really comes to life. When you see senior citizens who are so confused, they only vote for the president, or they just don't want to vote whatsoever, they don't understand the amendments or the issues or the things that come up on the ballot about important community issues, um, about, uh, I don't know, uh, state anti-immigrant measures, about gay marriage, about uh, whether or not the taxes should be increased, and all of that stuff that's on the ballot that you go and vote for. It's very, very difficult for somebody to understand in their second language. Um, some people, you know, really only recognize uh, the president's name, and they just vote for the president, and that's it, and that's their entire voting experience. Um, I've met a lot of elderly people who say, they were really confused when they were voting, when they were voting, and they don't even know who it is they voted for. Sometimes people who just come from the islands who are younger have the same experience. And then what happens around them is that uh, the generation or the folks who are bilingual who are trying to help them sometimes catch a lot of hostility for translating, for speaking Spanish in the polls, and you hear a lot of comments about, aren't you trying to tell that person how to vote? Why don't you learn English? You should learn English if you're going to be a U.S. citizen. Um, so. The language part of it is just one expression of the discrimination. A lot of other discrimination tends to happen in a cluster with the language discrimination. Um, so I just wanted to talk about some real examples and not just the numbers. Um, well, moving along to the third part of the article, which covers 1980 to 2008, what are the stateside um, Puerto Rican voting rights issues that came up? So there, the next 4E case since the 70s was the 1981 Jarena Valentin litigation. Uh, it was a great victory because it showed that the New York City redistricting scheme, scheme violated Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. Um, there was also a 4E claim brought on behalf of Puerto Ricans in New York um, that the ballot petition, I'm sorry, the candidate petition um, was not in Spanish. So uh, the candidate, Harina Valentin, when people signed to have them be included on the ballot and that became an issue and there was retaliation, um, Def actually brought the claim, well, why wasn't that petition provided in Spanish? And unfortunately, that claim was lost, and it kind of showed the limits of 4E. Um, and also something uh, that gives us some potential. Um, these days, whenever you have any language access um, um, cases or enforcement actions, it's very difficult to get any ballot petitions included in, in, in the remedy. Um, the remedy is limited to election materials that have to do with the election itself, the ballot and election materials, the voting instructions, the things on the wall inside the, poll inside the voting booth and the voter registration form, and things that are amendments have been held by federal courts not to be covered by the language minority provisions. Um, on the other hand, um, those cases that have been excluding the amendments are under Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act. Section 4E might be a little bit broader, and there's some clues in, in this case um, uh, because the judge said, you know, the only re the judge said the reason that uh, the candidate petition wasn't included under 4E is because the need wasn't shown. That if the community had been translating that ballot petition, and they may have been, and had brought that evidence to court, then that would have shown that there was a need for it. And if there was a need for it then perhaps the ballot petition, the candidate petition, would have also been covered by Section 4E. So Section 4E is actually a little bit broader than um, the other language minority provisions. Um, let's see. So we're going along in chronological order. When we talk about Puerto Rican migration from 1980 to 2000, um, there is another upsurge in migration from the island, bringing new waves to new areas. And very quickly, and generally speaking, um, there was a dispersal from the city to the suburbs in search of a better life. New York City still had the sta highest stateside Puerto Rican population, but it decreased a bit. It went from 860,000 um, in 1980 to 780 to 172,000 in the year 2000. And Chicago and Philadelphia were similar. Um, the satellite cities became important. People not only moved out to the suburbs, but also to satellite cities like Wilmington, Delaware, or Havistraw, New York. Some of these cities are covered under Section 203 and have the ballot in Spanish. Others don't. I mean, Wilmington, Delaware, and Havistraw, New York are a couple of cities where the community um, doesn't have access to the ballot in Spanish at the moment. Um, as far as the states go, looking at this new generation of migration from the island, the population in New Jersey increased, even though conditions in New Jersey have not been very good for Latino immigrants 
Um, the population increased, and more Puerto Ricans came to New Jersey. Um, uh, some of them live in covered jurisdictions, and 121,397 live outside of that Section 203 coverage. The population of Massachusetts grew very quickly, um, and um, it more than doubled during this time. Um, almost 200,000 Puerto Ricans live in Massachusetts, and almost half of them live in places where they're not covered for Spanish. Um, besides Worcester, where a lawsuit was won, giving right to the bilingual ballot. Um, in New York State, um, out of um, one million total, a very high amount are covered, because a lot of people still live here in New York, but still 214,853 are not covered and may not have access to the ballot in Spanish and may be experiencing uh, voting rights compromises. Florida uh, became the number two destination of migration from the island, and it has 61.31% of stateside Puerto Ricans. Um, a good number of them are live in, live in counties that are covered for Section 203 under Spanish because there are so many other Latinos there. They moved to places that met that threshold and they're covered for Spanish. But 150,617 are not covered under Section 203. And that's what some of us are looking into voting rights in Florida, which we will talk about later. Um, there are other significant Puerto Rican populations outside Section 203. Um, you can take a look at the numbers here, and they're all in the article as well. Um, and in all of these jurisdictions, um, about 40% were born in Puerto Rico. That means they went to school in Spanish, not English, unless they took English as a second language or became bilingual. But most people actually uh, have, become, have been educated with Spanish as their primary language. Um, and about 40% are limited English proficient. In 2000, the LAP rate in Puerto Rico itself was 71%. So that means that 71% of Puerto Ricans uh, don't speak English well. And circular migration still continues today. People go back and forth to the island. Um, also during this time period, um, a lot more research um, became available and a lot of studies um, uncovered some pretty serious problems of discrimination. Um, one are some and, and more characteristics about the stateside Puerto Rican community. Um, and uh, it was noted that there was a dramatic drop in voter participation from 80% on the island to 30% stateside. Um, there's one of the highest uh, indicators of voter, of voter participation in Puerto Rico in all of, uh, of the United States. And it drops dramatically when people come here. And I've talked to people who said, you know, yeah, I love to vote. I'm from Puerto Rico. I always vote. It's like, uh, uh, it's the best, uh, it, uh, it's, it's something I care about very deeply. I want to help my community vote, but it's just so hard here. Um, so that's uh, um, an indicator that there's probably some more Section 4E and other voting rights violations happening. Also during this time period, in 2003, the Department of Justice brought a Section 4E case in Reading, Pennsylvania, in Brooks County, Pennsylvania. And uh, the Department of Justice hadn't brought any 40 cases since those very beginning ones, the case of Maria Lopez and the case that went to the Supreme Court. Um, and um, um, the federal court held, um, as it was established in PROPA, that the right to vote includes the right to vote an informed and effective ballot. And what did that mean? For thousands of Puerto Ricans in Reading, English-only elections, the court said, were like going to a concert without being able to hear the music. The federal court held that 203 didn't replace Section 4E. Berks County said, we're not a 203 county. There's this 1975 amendment that came after 4E. Why should we have to do this? Well, that's because 4E wasn't replaced. It's still part of the Voting Rights Act. It's possible for these two sections of the Voting Rights Act to exist um, independently. Um, and the federal court also said that although Section 4E has been relatively unenforced, the Department of Justice could bring test cases to enforce federal voting rights law. It was irrelevant that it's been uh, relatively unenforced. And moreover, this case wasn't frivolous or de minimis. It wasn't just on behalf of one person that really wanted to have translation because they felt like uh, uh, it would make things easier in their life. No, this was on behalf of thousands of people who are limited English proficient, whose voting rights were very severely compromised by having the ballot in elections in English only. Um, uh, once the investigation got started, and then once the lawsuit began, the jurisdiction started adding a few bilingual poll workers here and there. And they started putting voting instructions in Spanish inside the voting machines. And I wanted to point out that, p that jurisdictions that put in a few bilingual poll workers and put a few things in Spanish are also not in compliance with Section 40 of the Voting Rights Act. 
because Berks County wasn't in compliance under those conditions, Section 40, if it's applicable, requires those three prongs that all of the election information be in Spanish, including the ballot and everything else that has to do with elections. Um, all of the, uh, the, that there has to be bilingual poll workers wherever they're needed. Um, and also that um, information, propaganda about election and voting rights that the jurisdiction um, issues have to be in Spanish in a way that reaches the community effectively. Um, since that three-pronged remedy was implemented in Reading, it's changed. Um, uh, people can vote in Spanish, people feel a lot more comfortable. Um, the jurisdiction has no problem doing it. Thousands of voters uh, feel like they can vote in informed and effective ballots. So that's um, uh, what litigation can do. Um, uh, moving right along in time, in 2006, the Voting Rights Act was reauthorized through federal legislation called the 2006 Voting Rights Act Reauthorization Act, and some more named after that too, but this is the short version. Um, this is a piece of legislation, an act of Congress, not just legislative history, and as part of this act of Congress, um, Congress took into account that, um, that recent litigation under Section 40 showed that there are still problems with discrimination against Latino voters and therefore the Voting Rights Act should be reauthorized. But they specifically recognized Section 40. So this is another piece of proof that it's still valid. Um, there is gonna be a need for future enforcement of Section 40, um, not only right now for these one million people who've been left out, but even beyond the next census. Um, one thing, um, um, that I forgot to explain about Section 203 and a lot of civil rights remedies is that uh, they get implemented after the decennial census. So we're about to have another census right now and it's really important that everybody participate. Um, so Section 203 is based on population thresholds and uh, if the jurisdiction passes that population threshold of 5% or 10,000 of its citizens being limited English proficient within the language minority group, it becomes covered and automatically, if we're talking about Hispanics or Latinos, has to put things in Spanish. Um, the determinations won't be issued until 2012 or 2013. Probably a lot more jurisdictions are gonna be covered, but considering that Puerto Rican migration, migration from the island to stateside, continues to increase, there are gonna be people who are left out even beyond 2012 and 2013. So right now we have a million people left out. I don't really think that that number is gonna go down. We'll see what the census determinations come out like, but there are gonna be people living in jurisdictions that aren't covered under Section 203 that won't have bilingual access to the ballot um, unless Section 4E is uh, enforced. Section 4E enforcement could be important also because this generation of stateside Puerto Ricans are living in very challenging times for Latino voting rights. Despite the importance of the Latino vote that was demonstrated quite clearly in the last election, there uh, continue to be many issues of discrimination that Latino voters experience, such as the kind of racial profiling I was talking about when Latinos are asked for ID and uh, non-Hispanic white voters aren't. It's also highly unlikely that jurisdictions will just volunteer to provide the ballot in Spanish and to provide Spanish language elections. Even though this is relatively easy and inexpensive, it's really easy to get bilingual poll workers. All you need to do is make sure when you hire poll workers, you hire people who are bilingual. There are plenty of people, I'm sure, in the room who are bilingual and would be glad to serve as poll workers. Um, as far as putting the election materials um, in Spanish, that's uh, relatively low cost. It's about $5,000. Uh, that's the median cost. So in conclusion, right now over one million stateside Puerto Ricans may be living without the protections of the rights guaranteed to them by the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Section 4E of the Voting Rights Act was enacted specifically to prohibit any denial of the voting rights of persons born in Puerto Rico and educated in Puerto Rico based on any inability to read, write, or understand any matter in the English language. The Supreme Court emphasized the practical effect of 4E was to prohibit denying the right to vote to large segments of the Puerto Rican community and thereby further the aims of the Equal Protection Clause with, the, with regard to the right that is preservative of all rights. This is from a 1966 opinion, but I think it still applies today. For Puerto Ricans, there's no requirement to speak English in order to be US citizens. And if the voting rights of many Puerto Ricans who have limited English proficiency are compromised if elections are held in English only. And um, that's the conclusion, was also the main thesis to start with. Um, as far as recommendations, I ended the article with recommendations. 
Um, I wanted to point out there's a footnote 312, and footnote 312 has a couple of new cases enforcing Section 4E in New Jersey and in Massachusetts. I know there's more cases to come in Florida um, from Florida. Uh, it's got one initiated and more investigations that are being done in other places. So that's my recommendation to lawyers is that we should be enforcing Section 4E. And I'd like to know what people in the audience think would be your recommendation of what to do with this information. And just another topic for discussion that I felt would be interesting um, is that we're talking about rights that are very specific to Puerto Ricans, um, but they can also benefit other Spanish speakers and other folks in the Latino community. And um, I find that very interesting. I'm wondering what you folks think about uh, you know, how, it, how it is that we can use any sort of uh, extra rights that Puerto Ricans may have because they're automatically U.S. citizens, unlike other members of the Latino community, to help along in protecting voting rights for other members of the community. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention and open it up for discussion and questions. What about Bloomberg and Fleet Clears? He didn't even get a right to vote. I'm sorry? Bloomberg got his term extended, or he, he got the ability to extend his vote beyond the term limits that were set. So is it not an exclusion, or we didn't even get a chance to even vote? I think it's under review right now. I believe it's, um, I believe you're talking about a voting change that's under review for preclearance by the Department of Justice, and it has not been cleared yet. No, but what do you think? Um, I'm actually, um, I'm, uh, I'm not uh, here in my capacity as a Department of Justice lawyer, and I'm not familiar with the details of that matter, so I couldn't comment on it. But I know that it's a voting change, and that it's up to, it's being reviewed um, to see if it will have a discriminatory impact. And so we'll see how that comes out, but it's a very important issue. I guess my question goes to the applicability that um, these are rights that are specifically for Puerto Ricans. Section 40 is specifically for Puerto Ricans. But if there are other Latinos living in the same jurisdiction that um, is required to provide the ballot in Spanish, they're going to have that access as well, too. Um, another comparable group of people, people um, is, is senior citizens and people who have uh, disabilities are not required to learn English to be U.S. citizen either. So, um, they don't have rights under Section 40 of the Voting Rights Act, but I think uh, the more that folks would know that it's not true that everyone has to learn English to become a U.S. citizen, you know, the more they might realize that they should respect the rights of voting Spanish. Um, but uh, you're right, they, they don't have the same rights. Um, this is specifically a Puerto Rican right, and I just wanted to see you know, what people feel about that. I mean, there are other things that the community does um, uh, because they are citizens, you know, and can be citizens, like, you know, um, bringing cases on behalf of immigrants and they have you know, a little bit more um, political space to be able to do that than other groups and uh, uh, because of, the, because of the, the different set of rights between people who are born U.S. citizens and people who have to um, try to access that in these really hard times when it's very difficult to become a U.S. citizen. Yes? I wanted to know, what are the consequences? Uh, so they violate uh, the rights you know, what, what happened? I mean, so, and the court decided you're, you're in violation. What happens then? Well, in uh, Pensgrove, New Jersey, and in Worcester, Massachusetts, where we just brought a couple of cases, they have to provide full bilingual access. And uh, federal observers are there as part of the consent decree. Um, and federal observers um, are uh, 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 neutral parties who just monitor the election and make reports and very, very thorough notes about how the jurisdiction is conducting its election. And if they're not in compliance, then they're gonna be in breach of the consent decree, and we can go back to court and make them come into compliance. So um, the jurisdictions where um, it has been enforced, um, 
uh, pretty much have been providing the ballot in Spanish and bilingual poll workers and in places where people have been seriously harassed for speaking Spanish, you know, that just stops. Um, and uh, sometimes it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, the corridors usually last for at least three federal election cycles because it will take that long of watching them very carefully to make sure that they come into compliance. So um, it does make them change. So the courts don't take over, like, you know, to ensure like they do with the civil rights cases uh, or I mean, the school integration cases where they, you know, they actually land the districts? That's happened in some voting rights cases and around um, other other Latino voting rights cases, but it hasn't happened in a 4E case yet. But it happened, you know, in Passaic, New Jersey, um, where uh, the Latino vote was being diluted, where they weren't providing any access in Spanish, where there was a lot of hostility and discrimination in the polls, and the local jurisdiction was just so uh, resistant to doing what they what the court had ordered that the uh, the, uh, the federal court took over the elections and. The jurisdiction had to pay for a special master, and the taxpayers got uh, pretty upset because that was very uh, costly as well. So they came into compliance. So um. I have a question. Who are the watchdogs for this? I mean, is it the Department of Justice? Is it, is it the community itself? How do these cases, you know, come to to light? Someone's coming into a polling place who can't vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, that's um, you know why I wanted to ask what the audience thinks because um, you know I actually just you know walked into seeing these violations and, and the case in New Jersey that I was describing and thought you know they've got to be happening um, across the country and then you know did this research and found that Poldef is also finding you know that there are violations across the country, but. Um, uh, as far as being a watchdog, um, you know, I think we need a very comprehensive strategy. Um, um, so, uh, you know, there needs to be litigation and there needs to be Department of Justice enforcement, but also, you know, just concerned citizens across the country, you know, calling uh, the groups and calling the Department of Justice and also, you know, talking, advocating for this type of change and across who, the country. Who gets that information out to the people, you know, so they know that they have these rights and that you know, they themselves have to be, uh, you know, the, the watchdogs, really. Yeah, no, it's a really good point. That's part of the reason I published the article, because I think I'd like for this to get out to the people a whole lot more, so people know that they have these rights. And um, even though this hasn't been enforced in a long time, uh, you know, hopefully people will read the article and, and you folks will tell everyone, too. Um, I think- Well, this is a great article for people who are, you know, erudite and who have- There you go. <laughs> have, have uh, you know an education that would allow them to understand you know at least some of this but um, what about people who are just you know everyday people who go into you know the vote and don't realize that this is there like how do you get the word out to them yeah how I'm does the community get that word out I mean, maybe some other folks who are here might want to respond, but I'm actually, I think that's a really great question, and I think there's a lot more work to be done in that regard, and um, a litigator might not be the best person, and, you know, the law review article, you know, helps get it started and putting it in Spanish, but I think, you know, there's a lot more work to be done in that regard, um, and, uh, you know, for the cases that we have won recently, to use them as precedent so that, you know, it's not only these two or three jurisdictions, um, but other jurisdictions, you know, wake up to the fact that they need to uh, provide the ballot in Spanish for Puerto Ricans. As, as a follow-up uh, to that question, um, I, I wanted you to clarify that Section 4E, mm -hmm. does it apply to, say, just one Puerto Rican educated on the island uh, that finds that he or she cannot vote, say, in Briggs County, Pennsylvania, or does it have to be a class uh, of Puerto Ricans that, you know, have to, you know, so if I, I'm bilingual, but if I happen to be monolingual in Spanish and, you know, live in, you know, Berks or what have you, mm -hmm. uh, and say I want my ballot in Spanish, and they say no, can I go to the Department of Justice? Can I go to the court and say under Section 4E, mm -hmm. I want my ballot in Spanish? Well, you know, um, the statute is written in the singular tense, and that's what the law says, that uh, no Puerto Rican should be denied, their, no person should be denied their voting rights based on an inability to read, write, understand, or interpret any matter in English. So if that's what the statute said, you might be in a tougher situation 
of Venice if you're part of a significant Puerto Rican population. Because so far, all the cases that have been won have been either an individual who's very badly abused, like Maria Lopez couldn't even register to vote. This was a very serious individual violation that became a class action, or they've been part of a big class of thousands. And so, you know, we're just gonna have to see um, how the courts interpret it. But the statute is written in the singular tense. And uh, my reading is that, you know, you would be, um, let's say you live in Wyoming, and you're the only Puerto Rican, you know, in your county, and you go to vote in Wyoming, um, and, and you're monolingual in Spanish. You might not be able to get them to put the ballot in Spanish for the whole county and have bilingual poll workers for the whole county, but you may be entitled to some translation under the statute. So the remedy might be different because the statute is indeed written in the individual um, tense and, and uh, no person educated in Spanish on the island should have their voting rights conditioned in this way. So I mean the question and your answer I think helps answer also the question by the, by the lady that uh, it actually is a collective effort. Yes. So, I mean, you do have to look at, you know, how many people are being affected and then organize, you know, uh, either, you know, as a group of citizens that are concerned, contact the Department of Justice or get investigators to do it. Uh, but I, I also wanted you to clarify, you've mentioned a couple of times that Section 4E uh, protects Puerto Ricans born on the island that, you know, were educated on the island. And it is the birth part that I'm not clear about because I thought that the section only talks about people educated in American flag schools whose language of instruction is other than English. I don't think it says anything about, you know, you have to be born in Puerto Rico so long as you are educated in Puerto Rico. Right, the only reason I keep saying born is because the census doesn't have any information about education, but the census has information about place of birth. So um, it's been considered in these cases that if you have um, people born in Puerto Rico, they are probably educated in Puerto Rico. So, so that's um, the I probably said born too many times, but that's what's kind of used to prove that you're educated in Puerto Rico. Right. So you may be an individual plaintiff. Of course, you can testify. I was educated in Spanish in Puerto Rico. I don't really fully understand all of this in English. I really would like to vote in Spanish. Although um, as a result of the migration process, there are many Puerto Ricans born in the States that end up going to Puerto Rico and educated in Puerto exactly. Rico. Exactly. So um, when I was on that slide about the numbers born in Puerto Rico, there was actually um, um, more people than not 40% or 38% that the statute applies to because of circular migration. Now, on the other hand, there are a lot of people born in Puerto Rico who um, are bilingual. So uh, I think it kind of comes out in the wash. but. Um, you know, there's just no census data about how many people are educated in Puerto Rico, which is interesting because the census measures things that are considered important to people to help enforce civil rights, and you know, sometimes it doesn't measure you know the things we'd like it to measure to prove our civil rights cases. So we're stuck doing something a little bit different. Sir, and now what what uh, would happen if it's the opposite? If a uh, Puerto Rican born here mm -hmm. who doesn't speak Spanish goes back to Puerto Rico? and he wants to vote there. Well, actually, there was a case just like that, the Differenderer case, it's, um, and there was a, pers a uh, person named Mr. Differenderer who was in Puerto Rico, and he uh, doesn't speak Spanish, and he wanted to vote in English, so he took it to the Federal District Court of Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and won, yeah. and um, there was a decision out there saying that that person had the right to vote in English. Um, I think, you know, um, just as a general policy matter, you know, that's very interesting. I mean, it's very interesting that the federal court of Puerto Rico was willing to do that and that the government of Puerto Rico, you know, is gonna be obliged to do that. But uh, Mr. DeFerrandero didn't have as strong of rights because he doesn't fall under section 4E of the Voting Rights Act. And he's not a member of a language minority group either. So if you read that opinion, the judge actually uh, talked about freedom of speech and freedom of association and that he thinks that the language minority provision should have also included English, so why not do it? It's, a, it's something that is not as strong of a right as Section 4E is. Very is interesting. Huh? Is it yeah. Not that I know of. But is, but is it applied to between the remedies and translator or is it a ballot? The whole ballot was in Spanish and English. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they were printed Spanish. it. Yeah. But, yeah. but I won. Now about the language issue, maybe you can help me with this, which actually is not 
and their logic. So, if the Congress asks for it, can, can, can the Congress ask for it or should they ask for a statehood? That before they, they turn to statehood and to state, they have to learn English first. Can they do that? I mean, the Congress can do whatever they want, but that would not probably work. <laughs> so, no, but I mean, because, no, because, I, I, because that would be like a trick, you know what I mean? If they, yeah. don't, want, if they don't want to give statehood and we vote for it, can yeah. they do that? I mean, like, if, you ask, if we ask, we want 100%, we want to be state, can the Congress say, okay, but you have to prove me that 80% of you speak English. I don't know. I, mean, I live in the District of Columbia, and I would really like to be a state. And they are taking away our gun control laws <laughs> in exchange for it. So you know, they negotiate what they want to. That's what I mean. That's what the Congress so does. They can do that, right? So you know, I, I um, uh, let me like see. Hawaii I think they're going to a deeper Florida. level because yeah. that could also violate Section 40 of the Voting Rights Act. That could also violate Section 40 of the Voting Rights Act, I suppose. No, but that's what I mean. Yeah. No, because in Alaska, most of the people that, that vote did speak English, and, and, and in, in Hawaii too. They were, they were Americans. Oh, yes, they were. Yeah, they were. Most of them. Native Hawaiians, most of them speak English? No, 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 but most Native Hawaiians didn't vote. Oh, wow. There's actually some. You know what I mean? Yes, I did. No, but the, um, the, the after the mission into the Union of uh, New Mexico and Hawaii, they, after the admission, they passed a local law to declare Spanish the official language of New Mexico alongside with English, and Hawaiian to be the official language alongside with English in Hawaii. But that was after the admission. It wasn't a precondition of admission. I suspect that legally Congress can assert a precondition and would amend or supersede for e. Um, so to require English uh, proficiency yeah. as a condition of statehood. It doesn't necessarily have to even amend for it because the, the fact that you're Spanish monolingual in the United States will still be a right that you can assert. So they, and, they can probably do that they want. And not only that, we can, we can argue that they gave us the citizenship without speaking English. So that can be an, argue, an argument too. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Why would they ask us to speak English to, to turn into Spain? If they granted us the the citizenship without the English, so you know, right? Right. I and guess that's Puerto Rico is always a big difference <laughs> because you're with uh, with statehood, you're asking for two Senate seats and a redistribution of, of the uh, congressional seats. So Seven you're not asking just for the but the right to vote of people who live here. But all the time, the United States is saying that as soon as we ask for, they will respect our free. Mm -hmm. You know determination. Mm -hmm. That's what they are saying. So that's why I'm asking you this this question. Yeah, I don't think the Congress has thought of that one yet. But <laughs> never mind. <laughs> so I don't. No, I, I think no, that would no, be terrible. But clear to me, this discussion here. Right. I said, mm, they can do that because they didn't ask us for English to turn us into. Yeah, I mean, maybe you would have this whole history of saying, you know, they tried to make English part of a mandatory. And they found that kids would go home and they couldn't understand their parents, you know, because they were only learning English and not Spanish, and nobody could really function. And the idea that Puerto Rico was a gateway to, you know, Latin America didn't work any longer either. So mm -hmm. it's an experiment that's been tried and failed uh, disastrously. So maybe uh, I, I don't know what Congress will do, but I hope they don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Diana. Well, I was going to ask, what kind of damages? You know, I haven't looked into that part of it, but have the private groups done that? Um, because I think that uh, um, I haven't seen individual damages addressed in the 40 cases, but I know that the groups that brought the cases in the 1970s got um, attorney's fees, so they were able to bring these class action lawsuits. I don't know if there was anything you know, to distribute to the victims, um, because uh, the, the, uh, the remedy is usually you know, the full restoration of voting rights, providing access in Spanish. So I haven't seen any money damages for E uh, cases, but that would be an interesting thing to look into. Yeah. Um, once you can't vote, you can't vote. You know, you can't take that election and, and give it back to the voter. So there has been a damage done. Yeah. Well, you're, s you're saying essentially that in order to be able to enforce, or to really enforce this, this law, you need people who are actually in these 
excessive distance where there are a lot of Puerto Ricans to watch what's going on and then to take these cases, to bring it to the Justice Department for litigation. That's the first thing. Yeah, well, pretty much that's so one avenue. Or there's nothing else you can do. Uh -huh. you know. There are actually a few other things that you could do, which I'm gonna just clarify, I'm speaking in my personal capacity, but you could go and talk to your um, boards of elections and say, you know, I looked at the census data, and I'm here in Monroe County, how come the ballot's still only in English? You know, this is from the case of Maria Lopez from so long ago, what's going on with that? You know, and see if you could negotiate something, you know, do a local advocacy effort, you know, do, um, some sort of other effort, you know, there are all kinds of ways to make change happen, not but just through lawsuits. But in the end, mm -hmm. unless you have litigation, and this is not being enforced, the law, you can't really do anything. Well, I think, down to that, right? yeah, I think, um, you know, the way that impacts litigation should work is that you have a case that's an example, you know, that if you, um, you know, you should do this in the rest of New Jersey because Salem County, just got sued, you know, yeah. and they have to do it. Or you should do this in the rest of Florida because Pearl Death just sued Volusia County and you don't want to be their next target. So maybe the other ones will, you know, kind of fall into um, compliance or maybe they're going to be so reticent you have to sue every one of them. But, you know, that's the idea of making an impact with the litigation is, is complementing it with other strategies which are kind of beyond, you know, my jurisdiction. But I think, um, you know, the more that people talk about it and the more that people protest one way or another or complain one way or another, you know, the more that it may change. Actually, you, you raise an interesting point that, uh, uh, that, that you're unaware of any research that actually has been done which sur has surveyed those areas uh, where you might find violations of this and then actually have someone go there to the uh, voting boards or whatever, mm -hmm. and to see if they did actually provide bilingual uh, materials. And if we could have a team of people, the Great Student Project, go out and uh, collect that information, then we would know where to keep our focus on the next time around. Mm -hmm. Aside from the fact that it's just a, a straight, beautiful, uh, practical, you know, uh, uh, applied research, simple, mm -hmm. right? That would be you, you're not aware of any search that has been done like that, where, where students or researchers have looked at areas where there might be, given your layout demographically, of the areas where the population now is, is edu edging past the threshold, and, mm -hmm. uh, and do some kind of survey like that. You're not aware of any published no, 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 that would be an excellent student project, and it wouldn't only have to be places where there, it passes a threshold, but where you find, you know, there are, uh, you know, a great number of, of Puerto Ricans, or even one, you know, even the example of one individual, but, um, you That's know, right. to, to make the biggest difference, I would start with the biggest numbers. What, you know? what, you, what you've done is also, what's interesting is that the, uh, this is not a regionally focused problem. It seems like there are pockets throughout the areas where the diaspora is, where we could, even old communities or mm -hmm. old settlements, where uh, these violations may be actually occurring. The question yes. would be whether there's any registry of this type of, you know, uh, translation of violent penalty. Mm -hmm. Do you know any, any database that will have the, the, the counting of translation, violent translation, of that kind of stuff? Or I mean, Naleo. What? The National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials might have some su such type of research. You know, the, but the, the, the population was issued. The population side is pretty easy to do. But, but what you're yeah. getting at, you're trying to prove whether or not there are jurisdictions that are not providing information in Spanish. Yes. That's yes. At the last election, that's right. You can conclude that the ones that are providing information in Spanish can be identified, and everybody else is not. You can literally conclude. I mean, you can double check it by sending it to students, but you're not gonna, you're not gonna earn, earn up anything new. But it's a big sort of registry of that. Part. No, but there, but but there has been quite a bit of research to demonstrate the level of compliance with 203, mm -hmm. and there's been quite a bit of research to demonstrate that that level of compliance is not uniform. Right. But there's quite a number of jurisdictions that only provide the basic 203, three prong stuff. You can match that with where Puerto Rican communities are, and if you want to pick. The best cases, okay, so you can do that. that. Now we're talking about but, that's but here's my point: that's everything that's outside of 203 and everything outside of the cases Kathy just talked about right. is open field money. You can, I bet you a hundred dollars, 
But, but Most I, cases I, not to allow Spanish language translations. But I think that the, the case uh, to, uh, Ant is uh, making is to actually test. Yes. The, that's a good, the, that's the, a good point. But that, that gives you the most recent live example mm -hmm. of what the practice is going to work. That's for sure. And it's not happening. Yeah, you could absolutely do a study that because that hasn't been done already. I know a lot of them have been done to agree that here are the jurisdictions and this is the percentage of compliance and this is sort of a big analysis that was made. So you could do the same thing with Section 4E. We would start by doing the population of Puerto Ricans and then from there you figure out a compliance like. You could either find out what types of ballots are translated and but the that's the point. Things. If yeah. there is no database for that, it's almost impossible to really scan. Uh, you have to send people actually look. Mm -hmm. But if there were other type of well, you could contact each supervisor of elections in each county in specific areas of, of with the Puerto Rican population. You could say what 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 two materials were available. You know, and then from there, kind so of that's a survey. Right, I right. mean, I was trying to see whether there is a repository mm -hmm. where you can do the statistical analysis and, and get the, the information. A, so lot of, a lot of it's online, too. A lot of the election well, materials this, are online. This so. is a very interesting intersection between mm -hmm. the law, advocacy, and research, mm -hmm. and it's precisely the area where Sector likes to go. I mean, like, find places where mm -hmm. scholarship will actually be uh, people reading. So we, we, we would love it. I mean, right. Latino Justice Wellness has a case. Oh, it would be somewhat rare. It great to see a study of here are all the Puerto Ricans throughout the country, and here are the, the counties that are not providing the ballots, right. and or like necessary assistance. Because there might be some stuff, but it may not be enough. Yeah, and the places that you know I talked about in um, the section on uh, this new generation of migration, unidentified right. people living outside of two or three jurisdictions, just with, if they had anything in Spanish, I wouldn't have, you know, I wouldn't have written that part. You know, they don't, and like one said, you know, and unless they, I, they would uh, stand out if they were doing anything in Spanish, you know. And they haven't done a thorough national study, which would be very, very, very helpful, but, you know, you could just get online and look at, you know, Monroe County today, and you can see that uh, if, uh, if the ballot's not in Spanish in Rochester, then, um, you know, they published their ballot online, so it would be a very interesting project. Well, that's much easier than, than anything else. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Is it that the only Puerto Ricans have standing to, to, to challenge this? Yes. So, so Spanish-speaking citizens, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who are not Puerto Rican cannot, they don't have these materials available where they live, they cannot demand them? Um, unless, no, not unless they were covered under another section of the Voting Rights Act, and oftentimes that might happen, but um, the plaintiffs, the only people who would be plaintiffs under Section 3 would have standing to challenge would be Puerto Ricans, because Section 3 was written especially for them. Um, but, 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 uh -huh. just a quick question of clarification. The designation of the uh, World uh, Act uh -huh. of limited English proficiency yes. is based only on the data that's in the center? Yes, and Section 40 yeah. does not use that language. I'm just using it to show that at least 40% um, of the population is, uh, or at least, uh, it doesn't use that language, but uh, the census data is there. So we know that at least that number of people who answered that question on the census that way are likely to fall under the protections of Section 4E. But Section 4E uses completely different language. Um, limited English proficiency is a census question about speaking English, and Section 4E is about reading and writing and understanding English. So I've actually met people who speak really pretty good English because um, they get around fine in life, but because they were educated in Puerto Rico, reading the ballot in English is very difficult for them. So um, um, just to, to the census data is out there, and there's not really census data about 4E, and um, uh, uh, the LEP measure is, um, uh, because people admitted on the census, it's probably an undercount, and there's probably even more people who fall under 4E because it's a higher standard than, than, than the LEP data. Um, under Section 4E, you don't have to have a threshold. You know, five percent of the population is just, you know, population. Now, considering that the language minority issue, uh, to some extent, within the VRA, was spearheaded precisely because of Section 4E, that then gave way to Section 203 and others. Yes. Uh, you know, in terms of standing. <coughs> 
well, only Puerto Ricans can bring cases uh, under Section 4E, you could have a community that is Latino and use a Puerto Rican educated on the island to uh, serve as, a, uh, as, as, a, as the person with standing to bring a case that would benefit all other Latinos in the jurisdiction. Yeah, that's true. The so that's also another a way to, you know, organize collective action along Hispanic lines, Latino lines, uh, but using Puerto Ricans as plaintiffs. Right, right, and there may be other Latinos who have, um, you know, other claims. In the case in Penns Grove, New Jersey that we brought, there was a Section 4E claim because um, something like 70% of the Hispanic population was Puerto Rican, and nobody wanted to do, or the, the, the local officials did not want to put the ballot in Spanish and did not want anybody speaking Spanish in the polls. But also Latinos, all Latinos were racially profiled when they went to vote. They were meant, they had to show an ID, whereas non-Hispanic whites, you know, they didn't have to show an ID. And other people who spoke Spanish weren't allowed to speak Spanish um, in the polls. And so there was another claim under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act that was joined with the Section 40 claim. In um, the city of Worcester, there wasn't any other claim under the Voting Rights Act. There was only a 4E violation, but right now in the city of Worcester, you know, other Spanish speakers, not Puerto Ricans, have the ballot in Spanish. They get the benefit of it, you know. So, and I just think it's um, it's interesting to talk about, um, you know, what are the dynamics of that kind of strategy? You know, does a, a you know a, uh, does it make sense to have the Puerto Rican rights, you know, spearheading things? And so far, I think it has been helpful in the cases that we brought, and you know, maybe in other cases. But as an organizing tool, you know, it might be important to also um, uh, use a strategy that's um, that's more inclusive, you know. And no, I mean, but it did because I mean, Section 4E, I mean, it protected about a million Puerto Ricans in 1965 here in the states but who are Spanish speakers and educated in Puerto Rico. Right. But, for instance, in, for, by comparison, you had a Mexican origin population that was certainly more numerous uh, that, that benefited until 1975. Right. Once the ground was broken by, you know, Puerto Rican efforts. Yes. On that note. Okay.